So as the Prime Minister finally breaks his silence on Kashmir and reaches out appealing for peace, even playing on the word Azadi and saying Kashmiris enjoy Azadi just as all Indians do, it's time to introduce our newsmaker on the program today, somebody who has been in fact imploring the Prime Minister to speak all these days, former Chief Minister of Jammu and Kashmir and leader of the National Conference in the state, Omar Abdullah. Welcome to the buck stops here, Omar. Let me start by asking you, you have uh, you know, you have tried in all your comments to, to not really play the role of an opposition leader alone. You have tried to be bipartisan about what's happening in Kashmir. Wearing your bipartisan hat, not wearing your national conference hat, how do you see the Prime Minister's comments and his decision to finally speak on the 32nd day of the valley in lockdown? Well, I see it from, from uh, two points of view. Uh, one is... Uh, the fact that he's finally spoken, that it took 32 days and uh, more than 50 deaths is a case of better late than never. Uh, so the fact that the Prime Minister has actually acknowledged that there is something wrong in Jammu and Kashmir and that there is a problem that needs acknowledgement and resolution is, is, uh, is a good thing. But at the same time, uh, I'm uh, very disappointed that once again uh, he's looking at Jammu and Kashmir through the prism of development. Uh, that development is the solution to all problems. Uh, his uh, PMO uh, Twitter handle put out a tweet saying that both the Mehbooba Mufti government and the central government are focused on resolving all problems through development. Now, the problem in Jammu and Kashmir is not one of development. If development had been the issue, the problem wouldn't have arisen in 1989. This is a problem that is political in nature. The, the youngsters who have died over the last 32 days, uh, the thousands who have been injured, I, I, I'm sorry, but the, the vast majority of them have not done so because they're looking for jobs, have not done so because they're looking for development, have not done so because they want an addition to the previous 80,000 crore package that the Prime Minister announced. I mean, if development and money were enough to solve this problem, then the Prime Minister's 80,000 crores should have ensured that we didn't see uh, the sort of days that we've seen for the last 32 days. Mm -hmm. So the fact that the Mehbooba Mufti government and the central government are on the same page at looking th at this problem through the prism of development is one that uh, I'm, I'm disappointed by. I would have preferred or I would have liked the Prime Minister to have gone that extra mile and acknowledged that Jammu and Kashmir is different from other states. And as much as what you see here is not a problem or an uprising, uh, because of development or the lack of it. But uh, Omar, to be, uh, to be fair, the Prime Minister did also invoke the Vajpayee legacy, which has almost come to be the standard template now for all conversations around a peace process uh, in the valley. So when he invokes Vajpayee and he talks about Insaniyat, Jamuriyat, Kashmiriyat, isn't that taking the conversation beyond the absence of jobs or the development uh, uh, context? No, it isn't, because he used, he used the same words in, in Srinagar when he came for the public meeting at which he snubbed the then Chief Minister Mufti Muhammad Sayyid Saab, but then only announced an 80,000 crore package, turned around and said, I don't need lessons on Jammu and Kashmir, and that was that. So, I mean, if there was an intention of carrying forward Insaniyat, Jamuriyat, and Kashmiriyat, uh, why didn't we see it during these months uh, leading up to the trouble uh, that started a month ago. The fact is that there is no uh, recognition or acceptance at the central level and now, uh, as we've seen from the, from the tweets of the PMO handle, at the state government level of the need to address this problem politically. I think it's become very convenient to use uh, Atal Bihari Vajpayee's phrase of Insaniyat, Jamuriyat, Kashmiriyat, but then there are, no, there are no words that, there are no actions that follow on from these words and mm -hmm. that's where you end up with a problem like this. Omar, the Prime Minister did a very interesting play on the word Azadi. His, his decision to actually break his silence was made at a rally that was kicking off the beginning of the government's Azadi at 70 program, the Independence Day celebrations. And in a sense, he took this word Azadi, which is such a contentious word, whether it's in JNU or certainly uh, on the streets of Srinagar, and he said Kashmiris too, as all Indians, enjoy Azadi already, in, in a way saying up. Aap bhi azad hai. How did you see that play on the word azadi? Well, I mean, obviously he can't, he can't acknowledge uh, the, the azadi that these people are actually protesting for. Uh, the protests that you see on the street aren't about an azadi equal to uh, the azadi enjoyed in the rest of the country. These people want azadi from the country. And therefore, uh, while the Prime Minister is very good 
with the words that he chooses and, and how he uses them, whether within the country or outside the country. The fact is that nothing that he has said will actually address the sentiment that we've seen on the street over the last 32 days. This is not about the sort of azadi that the rest of the country enjoys. By, by that logic, Jammu and Kashmir actually enjoys a degree more because of the autonomous position that we have. This is about azadi from India. I mean, that's, that's the constituency that we need to bring back into the mainstream. That's the constituency that has drifted away from us. And telling that constituency that you have as much freedom as the rest of the country isn't going to cut any ice with them. Uh, and what neither is the promise to, of development. What would you have wanted him to say instead? Look, because we, isn't we have, it a case from of the, damned? From the very beginning, we have been saying that... Yeah. Sorry? I'm saying, isn't it a case of damned if he does and damned if he doesn't? Because from the very beginning, you have wanted him to speak. Now that he's spoken, you feel that it, it was platitudinous and in a way, nothing concrete was said. What would you have wanted him to say that would have made you feel a little better? As, as, we, as, we, told the home, as we told the Home Minister when he visited, as we have told others that we have interacted with privately, there needs to be an acknowledgement of the political nature of the problem. We can't bury our heads in the sand and hope that it goes away. You can't crush this, 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 this trouble every few years and hope that it never comes up again. This problem will keep coming up unless we recognize that it is a political problem. It requires political handling. And you saw the acknowledgement of that in previous governments, whether it was Atal Bihari Vajpayee's government reaching out to the Hezbollah Mujahideen, whether it was Atal Bihari Vajpayee's government talking to the Hurriyat Conference leaders, even at the level of the then Deputy Prime Minister, Mr. L.K. Advani, whether it was similar initiatives by the UPA government, both uh, uh, in, in, in public as well as the private uh, mm. discussions that had started between Mr. Chidambaram and some of the Hurriyat conference leaders. So there has been an acknowledgement of the political nature of this problem in previous governments. Unfortunately, the current NDA government seems to be unwilling to recognize and acknowledge the political nature of this problem. And that is the only sort of uh, grievance I have with the Prime Minister's statement. The fact that he's acknowledged a problem, great. But he needed to go the extra mile, not look at it through the prism of development. Development is not going to resolve this problem once and for all. Yes, you will get a temporary solution like a Band-Aid, but it will not be the solution that you require. If you want uh, that, that situations like this don't arise every few years, then you will have to handle this problem politically. Otherwise, you are going to end up with a problem like this every so often. But look at one of the comments he, he makes, which may have particular resonance for you because of what you had to experience and battle in 2010. Uh, he said that it pains him immensely when he sees young men who should be holding books and computers holding stones. And, you know, you remember what happened in 2010. You've often spoken about how it was one of the toughest phases of your political career and you learned your lessons from that. But this image of the young Kashmir boy and and they are boys because you know most of them I meet are between 16 and, and, and 20 ma maximum in their early 20s holding these stones when the Prime Minister says this do you not agree how do you look at this image it's almost styled on the internet you know them holding I mean, the stones. we have we have always said that we would we have always said that we'd like to see our youngsters holding pens and, and cricket bats and 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 sports equipment and and computers but I mean I again make the point these youngsters are not throwing stones because they want the Prime Minister to throw a, lap to throw a laptop at them. These youngsters are not throwing stones because they want uh, admission to, to uh, uh, skill upgradation courses. These youngsters are throwing stones because of a deep-seated deep resentment at the way in which their political aspirations are being ignored. Now, I understand that what they want, no Prime Minister of, of, of India will ever have the mandate to give. But at least the basic acknowledgement that, yes, there is a sentiment that needs to be addressed. There is a constituency that needs to be weaned away from trouble and brought into the mainstream. And that will happen once we first and foremost acknowledge that they are there for political reasons, not for economic and development reasons. Once we start handling the political sort of aspect of it, along with the development and the security aspect, only then will we reach a, a lasting solution. Our problem is that we are tackling it from two dimensions from the security dimension and from the economic dimension. We are refusing to acknowledge the political dimension. And until we acknowledge that third aspect, unfortunately, we are doing a disservice to ourselves and the idea of, of India that we want the people of Jammu and Kashmir to accept. 
But Omar, what we are seeing on the streets of, of South Kashmir uh, this time in, and, and even in other parts of the valley is something different, at least from what I've ever seen before. And, you know, 2010, for example, was in response to a fake encounter in Machil and then a tear gas shell uh, killing a young man, Tufail Matu. This time, these are, these are protests after the elimination of a militant. This is not for justice. This is something else. This is raw, unvarnished rage. How does any government deal with it? By first acknowledging that there is a reason for that rage. I mean, again, I, I make the point that, look, if, if you yourself are acknowledging that this is rage, this rage is not driven by an absence of jobs. This rage is not driven by an absence of, of development. There is something deeper to it. And, and that's what we need to acknowledge and then start working towards. If we are going to live in denial and believe that development is going to be the magic portion that will solve uh, the problem or that will address this rage, then it's not going to happen. Yes, there is anger. Yes, there is, uh, there is resentment. Yes, there is, there is rage and it's directed. I'm not for a moment suggesting that it's directed only towards the, the ruling establishment. It's directed towards everyone in the mainstream, whether it be the PDP, the National Conference, the Congress or the BJP. Yes, the ruling alliance is taking a fair share of it, but then that's because they're in power. But it's not as if uh, uh, the opposition parties are being spared this rage or this anger either. So yeah. we need to acknowledge that there is a reason for this rage and then try and chip away at it. Look, these eight-year-olds, these 10-year-olds, 15-year-olds, they're angry. Mm -hmm. But it's not as if their anger has crossed all bounds and that we will not be able to, 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 uh, to appeal to their, to their better senses. I'm sure we can. Yeah. But it will take time and it will take an acknowledgement of the problem. Unfortunately, and I make this point again, we seem to be unwilling, both at the state government level clearly and at the central government level, to acknowledge the political nature of the problem. I was going to ask you, uh, you know, and, you, and you said it yourself, that this is, a, this is an anger on the streets that could in fact hit all mainstream parties. I would go even further and say that even the Hurriyat Conference, the separatists are not necessarily in control of what's happening on the streets. And therefore, that begs the question that even if a government is willing to talk, who do they talk to? This is a leaderless eruption of anger and, and, and in some Look, cases, violence. The fact that this agitation is largely leaderless, and I, I, I accept your point. Uh, even the Hurriyat Conference leaders who would like to believe that they are actually directing this are passengers uh, on this, on this, this journey. Mm. Uh, they are issuing calendars, but their calendars are actually in uh, a recognition of public sentiment rather than drivers of that public sentiment. Mm. But let's assume for a moment that this rage, this anger, this phase of, of agitation will not last. At some point in time, hopefully, better sense will prevail and, and cooler and calmer heads will be allowed to prevail. At that point in time, there will be leaders that you can talk to. I, I refuse to acknowledge or refuse to accept that this situation will continue ad infinitum and that at no point will you have anybody uh, who is willing to come forward and talk to you. There are ways and means of doing it. And again, I don't expect uh, that uh, separatist leaders will, will, will suddenly troop into Seven Racecourse Road and sit down for a cup of tea with the Prime Minister. But there are ways in, 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 uh, that can be employed to begin some sort of, of dialogue process. They've been done in the past, both within our country. They've been done in, uh, in other countries as well. Yeah. It's only a question of having the will to give them a chance. That yeah. will is, is unfortunately missing at the moment. One of the more uh, contentious comments that, y that you made uh, was about Burhan Wani being actually more of a challenge from the grave than had he been alive. Do you continue to stand by that comment given how these last 31 days have unfolded? And is that a way of your saying that it would have been strategically smarter to not kill him? Absolutely. And I, I not only do I stand by it, I believe that the last 32 days have indicated what I said. I can guarantee you, unfortunately, from the lot of youngsters that have been injured over the last 32 days, we have created a huge wealth of, of uh, youngsters who can be weaned towards militancy. And all they will want is a weapon to be placed in their hands. I actually fear that, that you will find the ranks of militants and particularly youngsters from Kashmir, not militants from Afghanistan and Pakistan and elsewhere. Uh, who, who will be willing to join the ranks of militants. And the only thing that will hold them back is the absence of, of, uh, of weapons available to them. So I, not only do I stand by what I said, I actually believe that the last 32 days have vindicated the, the initial assessment that I made, that Burhan Wani and his death will actually do more 
to, uh, to bring about an, an increase in, in local militant recruitment uh, than would have been possible when he was alive. And, and I think that acknowledgement has, has sort of come in even from the state government. You've had very wishy-washy statements from both the chief minister and the deputy chief minister. Of course, they kept contradicting each other. Mm -hmm. But I think at a certain fundamental level, even they accept uh, that uh, perhaps this could have been handled differently. I mean, she eventually, Mehbooba Mufti did eventually uh, indicate that, it, that she was not in the loop. Uh, but you're right, there have been a number of contradictory uh, statements along the way. So had you been in her place, would you have, had you had the opportunity and been kept in the loop, asked the forces to not kill him? No, I have no, I, I have no idea why the chief minister is not in the loop. I mean, what is she the chief minister of then? How dare she not be kept in the loop? Are you telling me that there are operations and there is intelligence that is being generated in Jammu and Kashmir that is not being shared with the chief minister? And if that be the case, then what is she doing about it? I would have been unwilling, completely unwilling to accept a scenario where I had been kept out of the loop, where an operation of this nature was being conducted, I being the head of the unified command was not informed of the intelligence that was generated and the operation that took place. But and, you know, and, but you know I mean, the forces have since said we told, that it... No, but what we were told, what, what we were told initially yeah. was that she was kept informed of all developments. No, it was only subsequently that, that this position was changed. But be that as it may, you're asking me a hypothetical question as to what I would have done. I think uh, my, my earlier answer to your question is perhaps an indication of how I would have played this out. No, I was just going to say that the forces have also since argued that they did not even know that Bani was going to be at the encounter site. So, you know, uh, so they would then argue how could they keep her in the loop. But you are suggesting that given that information, if you had that information, you would still argue that it was a mistake, a strategic mistake to eliminate Bani and India and the valley was better served keeping uh him alive. And arresting him. I'm just saying that the last, the last 32 days have reinforced what I had said initially, that Burhan Wani is more of a rallying point for the disaffected young Kashmiri dead than he would have been alive. And, and when we meet, I'll be happy to, to, to take you uh, through this argument even further, but I won't, I won't do that right now. Let me ask you in the end, uh, there, are, uh, there are hawks on Kashmir who say that liberals, you know, like you, like me, like others who want to see a peace process in the valley, that we are in denial about radicalism, that we are in de denial about dimensions of Islamism that are now entering what was supposed to be a politically, you know, a, 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 a separatist movement is now becoming Islamized. How do you see that argument? You know, these same people live in denial about similar sort of radicalization in the rest of the country. Uh, I mean, this, you, you have radical elements that have grown in, in almost every religion. And in that, unfortunately, Islam is not an island that is uh, immune to such forces. You have, you have increased radical elements within the majority community of our country. And you similarly see increased radical elements within, within uh, uh, the, the Muslim community, both in the rest of India as well as in Jammu and Kashmir as well. That having been said, uh, I still believe that uh, the more uh, sort of uh, the, 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 the Kashmiri that, that holds some sort of uh, affinity and, and affection for what is traditionally called Kashmiriyat is still alive and, and is still there on the ground, uh, even though uh, possibly the, the, the forces that you are talking about do manage to gain the upper hand in situations like this. Even yeah. today, yeah. what you see in Jammu and Kashmir is political. There are those who will try and paint it with an Islamic brush, but it isn't. I mean, has the Taliban been able to hold, take root in, in Jammu and Kashmir? No. Have you seen any sort of effort towards linking what is happening in Jammu and Kashmir with ISIS? No. Yeah. Even now, when people are sloganeering, they're sloganeering for, 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 for freedom. Even if the mosques are being used, mm. even mosques in my neighborhood, yeah. when, when the slogans are being shouted, they're, sh they're slogans for azadi. They're not slogans for, for creating an ISIS like, like uh, 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 yeah. we establishment here. So I, st I, I still think that while there is that element that you're talking about, it hasn't overtaken everything else. Okay, quickly in the end, uh, since you've been there, you have been in this moment in 2010, a different context, I understand. Any words of advice to Mehbooba Mufti, who's in your place today in 2016? I think what Mehbooba Mufti needs to do is to convince government of India that development is not 
the slogan that is going to cut any ice with these protesters. The acknowledgement of the political nature of the problem and an actual desire to find a political solution is what the need of the hour is. Omar Abdullah, National Conference Leader, former CM of the state. Thank you. A pleasure to have you on the program this evening.